Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jonathan Citrin, and uh, I am a, a teacher at Harvard University on internet and law and policy kinds of issues. And it's my pleasure today to welcome uh, Brad Smith from uh, Microsoft to uh, have a chat for a while between us and then to welcome some questions from the audience using the various interfaces that Zoom has. Um, I should say, uh, Brad joined Microsoft in 1993, which uh, may be several eras ago in internet history. Uh, he took up uh, legal affairs in Europe for Microsoft when he first started, and then took a path that led him through being general counsel of Microsoft, later president, chief legal officer, chief compliance officer, some uh, simultaneously concurrent rather than consecutive sentences, as it were. <laughs> and. Uh, is somebody who has, during that entire time period, not just done all of those jobs with respect to the company and its both internal operations and external facing um, uh, ambassadorial roles, but has been thinking a lot about the evolution of technology. I first encountered Brad at one of several sort of propeller-hatted uh, legal and tech conferences where Brad would be presenting a paper along with everyone else. and joining the debate uh, as fulsomely uh, as everyone else. And I, I think he is considered these days indeed a sort of dean of the US tech sector and uh, very pleased to have a chance to talk to you uh, today. So thank you, Brad, for, um, for joining. Uh, well, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, you and I have had the chance to, you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, interact so many times, uh, you know, usually in person. Um, yeah, it's great to see you today, and I look forward to the day when we can be in the same room at the same time at Harvard or somewhere else. Indeed. Well, thank you. Uh, so just to start off, I want to go back to that sweep that I mentioned in your bio of just uh, uh, for how long you've been thinking about these issues and kind of in the midst of them. And I can't help on the academic side, but think of it almost as bookended by a 2001 article you wrote on the third industrial revolution, policymaking for the internet. I don't know if uh, Klaus Schwab over the World Economic Forum just wanted to one-up you with the fourth industrial revolution. I assume at some point you'll have the fifth. But uh, looking at that article and your most recent book on tools and weapons as kind of bookends to this, um, uh, I'm wondering if there's anything you would want to tell your former self uh, back in 2001 or even 1993 uh, with all of the benefit of hindsight uh, from today. And I say that as somebody who, in, in kind of looking over those bookends, there's a lot that's consistent between the two of them, including both a desire for a kind of effective self-regulation and failing that, a willingness, even an encouragement to governments to actually play a role. But I'm wondering what you'd want to tell your former self that maybe you figure you wouldn't have known then. Yeah, I think the thing that is uh, sort of interesting, the consider is just how the issues that you know that you've been working on that you know others at Harvard and, and people like me have been working on in the tech sector have just gotten bigger and more impactful and more uh, an issue of broad public attention each and every year. Um, you know, I think you captured the phrase well when when you and I first crossed paths, um, let's just say it was a narrower and more geeky crowd. Um, you know, and we, we intersected with sort of two sets of geeks, you know, technology geeks and legal geeks or legal and policy geeks. Uh, that 2001 article uh, that you referenced came out of a set of lectures I gave at the Hague Academy of International Law in the year 2000. And, you know, at that point, it was a rare day that you would see, you know, something around tech po policy and yeah, uh, the New York Times or, you know, say something like uh, Time or Newsweek, the major you know, weekly publications of the day. Um, if, if there was something in that space, it was a big antitrust case against a company like Microsoft. Um, and it, what has been so interesting is to see two uh, things evolve over the course of, say, 20 years. Uh, the first is these issues become so part of the popular public conversation. 
uh, for the simple reason that they impact everybody so broadly. And so, yeah, I would have given myself advice 20 years ago to think even earlier uh, about yeah, how to make these ideas approachable for other people and not just interesting for the deep conversations that, you know, say technology geeks or academics uh, need really to, to have. The, but the second thing that I think is interesting is to go back in time, so to speak. I remember in the late 1990s, there was no such thing as a privacy lawyer for the simple reason that there was barely any such thing as privacy law. You know, there was just a European Data Protection Directive that was enacted in 1996. Um, and now you meet people all the time who say, hey, I'm a privacy lawyer. Uh, and yeah, I think if you take those uh, thoughts and you put them together, uh, I think the real relevance uh, for say students at Harvard Law School or anywhere else uh, today is that we're seeing new fields born, uh, including in the legal field. Um, you know, there clearly will be people 10, 15 years uh, from now who will say, hey, I'm an, I'm an AI ethics lawyer or an AI human rights lawyer. I mean, just, uh, and, and yet I will say the need for broad perspective, even while these uh, fields continue to proliferate and, def and deepen, will remain. Uh, and I think that's what you've always brought in your work. It's what I've tried to bring together with others in bringing a bit of a historical perspective to provide that breadth of thinking. Uh, and we're just going to see this all continue, I think. So I, let me ask specifically around privacy and perhaps around security too. Of course, they're distinct. If I'm a member of the public, typically reading Newsweek, I remember Newsweek back in the day <laughs> and its equivalents now, uh, and seeing some of these tech issues occasionally pop into the broader consciousness. If I'm looking at that sweep, it's not as if privacy, quote, got solved. In fact, if anything, it feels like it's gotten more difficult and I'm feeling less secure online, despite the lawyers that have been working on it. Uh, some maybe cynically would say because of them. But uh, both from a security and privacy point of view, if we just went by headlines, mm -hmm. it would seem as if we're barely holding the line or maybe even falling behind. And that's despite, for example, in the security front, Microsoft starting a trustworthy computing initiative all those years ago saying, wow, we've really got to rethink uh, these architectures. And I'm curious, is that just a kind of headline grabbing thing? Or how would you characterize, is it possible to characterize the slope of the curve for privacy for the average consumer today? Well, the first thing I would say, again, sort of drawing on a broader perspective, look, once something becomes important in public life, it very seldom ever really gets solved, which is to say the issue doesn't really go away. Um, you know, civil rights hasn't been solved. Voting rights haven't been solved. Immigration hasn't been solved. Um, you know, world hunger hasn't been solved. Certainly disease hasn't been solved. Uh, you know, if you were to go back to the year 1900 and, and, and look at the questions people were talking about, especially at the dawn of the progressive era, um, you would find a definite uh, similarity between those questions and the questions people are asking today. The nature of the debate, you know, the advances, of course, they've been enormous. But you know, the issues to never really, in my view, uh, typically get solved. Now, well, having said that, privacy has advanced. I mean, there's, there's more than 100 countries that have privacy laws. And 30 years ago, it was you could count them on one hand. So the the field has advanced. Um, there are more protections in place. But of course, as technology has become more ubiquitous, I think you could also say the, the challenges to privacy, perhaps even the threats to privacy, have actually become more pronounced at the same time. And I think that explains why it hasn't been solved. Yeah, it's certainly harder these days not to have something recorded and shared than it is to record and share it. And that is a definite flip. And I guess maybe for many consumers, without even maybe having a, a worked out sense of privacy injury, there's often maybe just privacy surprise when you know a paper of record does a story about location data and how much your location data, it turns out, is shared. I had no idea Farmville. I thought it was a virtual farm. Why do they need to know where I am at all times in order to play their game kind of thing? And 
it, it kind of conjures up a vision of the duck serenely going across the pond while underneath the, the, the feet are madly paddling, gathering data, processing it in what otherwise feels like an organic experience. And I guess uh, just tying it back, of course, to the public health topic that looms over all of us at the moment, I'm curious if you have a sense of what it would look like to responsibly repurpose the commercial infrastructures built around data sharing and advertising and targeted and all that kind of stuff for which there may be some sense that it's time to trim that back. What would it look like to try to repurpose that for pandemic mitigation efforts of various kinds? Well, it's been interesting because I think in the current context, um, at one level, data has become the most indispensable tool in the world, I might argue, for enabling public health authorities to seek to manage their way through this pandemic. Um, and some of that data absolutely is uh, personal health information. It's personally sensitive. Uh, yeah, and in some ways, some of the governments that I've seen be the most effective have frankly just been really good at managing their hospital capacity. Uh, knowing where their ICU beds are, knowing whether they're occupied, knowing how long a patient has been in that bed, knowing what that patient's ailment is, knowing in particular whether that patient has COVID-19. And you know, I had a conversation with the Prime Minister of Greece. He can sit in his office at his home, and look at a laptop, and see a dashboard that has data real time on all the ICU beds in the nation of Greece. Um, you know, so that's, that's one example. Um, you know, there are other examples where you're seeing mobility data, uh, you know, just aggregated and used in really important ways by governors in the United States, by mayors, uh, to try to know, well, you know, are there social distancing measures working? In other words, are people staying home? And that is a very good indicator. Um, yeah, as we get more into this, uh, you know, we're seeing additional questions emerge, uh, additional tools created, uh, including obviously things like apps for, for uh, tracing and tracking and the like. And, you know, that's where you have potential tensions between privacy uh, for people and the protection of public health. Uh, you know, that's what led us to publish seven privacy principles. You all have focused very similarly at, at Harvard and elsewhere. And I actually think that it's a, a really good uh, indicator of how, if you look at both of these issues together and, and take a principled approach, protection of public health, protection of privacy, um, you can start to synthesize these two at the outset. You know, for example, you can say, look, if you're only gonna use, if you only want data for public health purposes, then you can only use it for public health purposes, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can then rely on the commercial infrastructure to, to support those kinds of principles. And, I, and I, I think Google and Apple have done a very good job in opening up their platform in this way. And then you'll get other issues where there is real friction or tension. And that's where I think public authorities need to decide based on their local values, uh, you know, how they want to strike the balance between privacy and public health. And in assuring privacy, there have been tugs of war over the years, the encryption battles, uh, the classic case of the San Bernardino iPhone in which Microsoft uh, weighed in on that dispute, largely if I'm not oversimplifying on Apple's side in that yeah, debate. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if you have a sense of the blend of protections for privacy as against government abuse. How much of that blend is wise laws and agreements and sort of legal institutional structures versus just making the technology such that it's self-protecting as much as possible, that we've got uh, various forms of technological separation, encryption, data minimization, so that even if a government was of a mind to go beyond whatever it had promised or to disregard whatever uh, international consensus there might be, that government simply can't do it. How do you think about that kind of blend? Well, I think technology is a powerful tool, including for protecting privacy. Um, but we do live in a world where the rule of law uh, you know, does override uh, you know, the code that people write. Now, ultimately, the laws of physics tend to trump everything. And if it can't be done, it can't be done. Um, but if you look at what Australia did a year ago, uh, you know, for example, they did pass a law 
that imposed on, say, cloud service providers and others additional legal obligations in certain circumstances to decrypt. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think things like encryption have proven to be of fundamental importance. Uh, you know, the whole industry shifted rapidly to encryption at rest and encryption in transit for, for data. Uh, you know, in 2013, in the wake of the Snowden disclosures, and there's been this debate ever since about, you know, whether this was unduly undermining the effectiveness of law enforcement and national security. Mm. Um, but I would just say at the end of the day, um, you know, governments do prevail within their territory, uh, and they can set the terms for whether a company can offer a service to the public there. Uh, and it can put a company in a position of then just having to decide do I go there or do I not? Uh, and the same is true for data. Uh, you know, we make you know, careful decisions based on elaborate human rights reviews uh, before we decide to put a data center in a new country, uh, before we make decisions about whether to store consumer data uh, in the data center in that country. Because once the data is there, uh, the government's law is going to be ap ap applied if the government so chooses. One um, possibly subtle distinction, but maybe worth briefly making, is a sense that the San Bernardino case was really just kind of an appetizer in the sense that if a government had, using exactly the power and authorities you're talking about, ordered Apple to make efforts to get into that phone, Apple, for that particular phone and technology, was in a position to do it. Um, later versions of that phone, and generally there is an evolution of technology, uh, I, I, I can discern sometimes attempts by the companies to just design the technology so they're in no particular privileged position to decrypt if they're asked to, that the data is stored encrypted and there's no key held by uh, the company and there's new technologies to still make it useful even if the company itself can't get to it. Um, I imagine the response to that, if a government is feeling like it really wants access, would be what you call technology mandate, saying you're just not allowed to build a service or even a product that doesn't uh, keep the key somewhere in a back pocket at the company making it. And I'm just curious, just in your crystal ball, do you think we'll see those kinds of technology mandates become common? I think it's a really interesting question, and you know, and love your thoughts for that matter as well, because you've been involved in this obviously as long as I have. It is so interesting on the encryption debate because it it, it tends to become uh, an issue front and center. You think it's going to come to a head, uh, and uh, then it dissipates. Uh, and it, it, there is never really that much of a successful effort, at least to even identify whether there's potential common ground. Uh, you know, for people, it, it is an issue that does tend to drive people into their corners. Yes. Um, you know, basically, you know, the privacy advocates and typically with the tech companies, um, you know, explain why we're opposed to technology mandates. Um, you know, law enforcement usually then is quick to parade its, hor its parade of horribles, yeah. uh, you know, in terms of terrible crimes uh, that are, indeed heinous, uh, yeah. that they may feel that they cannot investigate and prosecute. Um, and then there's a lot of drama, and then the chapter ends, and <laughs> the next chapter sort of starts the same way. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think the real question in some ways is, why have we seen that for a decade without the kinds of uh, forcing functions or uh, you know, even you know, some meeting of some common ground, is, or is it just a case that this issue is so binary that that's impossible? Uh, or, or is there some other aspect? I, I, and what do you think? Well, I think that um, I find myself sympathetic to having in the blend technological protections that at the very least represent a bright line of paint on the side of the road. So everybody's aware if that line is being crossed, maybe with a warrant, maybe not, but you, you can establish boundaries in code that uh, can reinforce whatever boundaries seem wise in corporate policy or ultimately uh, in law. But it's also true that if too much stock is placed in the code as the last refuge of protection, it also then creates a kind of digital divide that the people who know how to just tweak just so, I mean, I, bless 
uh, something like PGP, pretty good privacy, uh, well, elderly plugin at this point for uh, <laughs> securing email and other documents end to end. But an average user trying to get pretty good privacy going, it's hard. And I think what it would mean is uh, it might be nice to come to an accommodation about what would even be offered by default. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist uh, in order to enjoy the hypothetical protections you could if only you knew how to configure the technology. I'm mindful of our mutual colleague, Bruce Schneier, who at one point, security expert, decided he wanted to set up a definitively secure laptop and ended up you know, in the same place all of us have been, <laughs> with customer support and drivers that don't work and all of that kind of stuff. And that's a cross-platform uh, kind of issue. Now, I, uh, one, I, actually, I, I actually think yeah. that observation is important because I think it does explain why this issue doesn't come to a head. Mm. I think you do see um, more tech companies uh, create strong privacy protection features, mm. um, but they're not necessarily turned on by default. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, and I think that you know, it turns out that a lot of criminals are not the smartest people on the planet. Uh, and so I think in, on many days, law enforcement is able to get what it actually needs to get because the user who is committing a criminal act didn't turn on the privacy protection. Yes. A strange uh, uh, analog counterpart to that uh, in the American constitutional context is the famed Miranda warning uh, that says anything you say can and will be used against you from the 60s Warren court and known to watchers of law and order worldwide um, is an important right. You've got to say those magic words to a uh, person under arrest or anything they later say maybe can't be used against them. At the same time, while that is a right, as you say, many criminals talk anyway, you can imagine a station house lawyer whose only job is to sit in a police station and as the uh, people arrested or brought in says, hi, I'm willing to be your lawyer and here's my only piece of advice, I'll put it on a card, don't say anything. <laughs> and that would probably have a material impact on what the police could elicit from the people they arrest. And my guess is civil libertarians who uh, among us feel very supportive of Miranda would, all right, we gotta think through additionally whether we would really want it to work that well. Uh, understanding, though, that we fight for is a right. It's a kind of similar thing about defaults and and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a good um, point. Now, there's another area just worth bringing up that if it had been, if we were in 2001, would probably be the first one, and that's copyright and open code and intellectual property, which maybe over the years has receded, even though, as you've pointed out, it's not like it was ever definitively settled. And there's uh, such a, a provocative, interesting quote from Tools and Weapons in which you say Microsoft had been on the wrong side of history. And uh, what a just kind of fascinating um, sort of observation, uh, kind of reflection to make. And I'm just uh, curious, looking at things now, how to think through the role of copyright or even later patent. I remember once at a conference, it was surprising to me at the time, you said, yeah, we're not, we're not thinking so much about copyright for code, but patent, that's kind of interesting. And I'm just curious, as you think about the development of intellectual property law with respect to code and maybe for data protection, if you want to just unpack a little bit more how your thinking has evolved. Yeah, the first thing I would say is one of the interesting things about intellectual property is that it has four distinct fields. Patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. And it, for many works, it's very clear what your field is. Yeah. You write a book. I write a book. It's called copyright. Uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, and yet as software code was created, um, interestingly, you know, actually all four fields became relevant uh, to software. You know, copyright to copy, to protect against literal copying, uh, you know, patents to protect the, obviously, the, the novelty and, and utility of certain inventions. Trademark is and remains important to fight counterfeiting. And, and, and you know, frankly, if all three fail, you tend to keep your code secret through trade secret protection. Mm -hmm. um, what we've seen over time is a little bit of a battle, almost, if you will, between the importance of copyright and the importance of patents. And, you know, as you'll remember, in the, in the 1980s and 90s, 
these people first thought, oh, everybody's going to use copyright. Uh, you know, they're going to protect not only against the copying of uh, literally of code, but you know, uh, of the you know uh, essential expression uh, in it. And then the Supreme Court you know, was less than enthusiastic about that, uh, and people shifted to patents. Uh, you know, when I started at Microsoft in 1993, there were probably only two patent lawyers. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't just because we were a smaller company, it's because patents were not thought to be as important. Uh, and then the early 2000s saw an explosion of patent law. Uh, and then slowly but surely, uh, the, the, the power of patent protection and for code was sort of whittled back uh, through a combination of judicial action and, and, and congressional reform. But I would that's say a zone in which Microsoft is both the hunter and the hunted, right? I mean, Microsoft could just as easily find itself defending against a patent infringement suit as making one. Well, one of the things I've always really liked about working at Microsoft is because our business is so diversified. Um, on any one of these issues, we sort of have a, a, a foot in each shoe. Uh, and that forces us to think about it from both sides. It definitely doesn't mean we get it right. Um, but it's a really a positive thing to have to do. Um, you know, the, the specific reference I, I made in our book uh, it was that we were on the wrong side of history, and I personally was definitely on the wrong side of history. It was really you know, a, a reference to open source. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know, Microsoft as a company in the early 2000s leaned in on patent protection, uh, specifically to uh, protect what we saw as the valuable features in Windows uh, in terms of what it, it meant to see something like Linux. Um, you know, and ultimately we ended up concluding that, uh, you know, it wasn't just about getting on the right side of history. It was just getting it right. Uh, and, you know, and, and getting it right basically meant becoming part of the open source community, even if it didn't mean that all of our code is open source. Look at any big tech company, not all of its code is open source. Um, you know, but we now contribute more code uh, to more projects uh, that are open source uh, than any company on the planet. And uh, I think as you look at data uh, and this whole next trend in terms of where technology is going, uh, you know, we're now advocates uh, for an open data movement. Uh, we launched a campaign a week ago. We call it the Open Data Campaign. We published open data principles. We committed ourselves to 20 open data collaborations in the next two years. Uh, yeah, and and you know, I would say broadly speaking, uh, success in technology these days is about innovation, meaning moving faster. It means about building an ecosystem, and that means collaborating more broadly. You know, all of this is much more uh, likely to influence success uh, than the ability to sort of lock up, so to speak, uh, your inventions. Doesn't mean that it's not important to have patent protection in a variety of spaces or fields. Um, but I just think the indicators of success uh, have really changed. Mm. Uh, let's just talk uh, harmful content for a moment. And again, a kind of evolution from the early days. As best I can tell, um, it's almost like a couple eras. The first I'd describe in American terms as a rights era in which often the sensibilities among the technical folks and among some of the companies was, we're here to empower the user and then kind of get out of the way. We give you an operating system, you want to load Napster on it, that's your business. <laughs> like maybe we don't approve of it, but don't, you know, the recording industry don't come to Microsoft expecting Microsoft to shoot down Napster on Windows installations as if it were malware because that's, that's not our job. And, um, Maybe starting around 2010, I'd identify a new thread uh, that is now uh, sharing the space with the rights sensibilities, which I'd call first metaphorically, and today it's hard not to be literal about it, the public health sensibility, which says, instead of it being paramount for companies to let their users just do what they want, have encrypted conversations with the people they wanna talk to, run the software they wanna run, collect the data they wanna collect, now it's, gosh, these companies, they shouldn't be abdicating. They need to be taking a moral stance about the behaviors they facilitate and should do something. And uh, as you say, Microsoft has so many different um, services and areas in which it operates. Maybe the one most clearly amenable to feeling the sharpness of that debate would be in a search engine like Bing. And I'm curious how you think about what role 
the company's own sensibilities should have on good content, bad content, misinformation not, versus just being a vessel for window onto the web and what people find is their own business? Well, I think there's two broad themes that are worth reflecting on. The first is that not all technology is the same. And the second is that even the same technology should perhaps be treated differently uh, as technology evolves in, in different moments in time. Mm. Um, when I think about technology today and the uh, obligations, either informally or legally under the law, uh, a technology supplier should assume, uh, I do tend to think of uh, three distinct categories. You know, one is platform space. Uh, a second is, especially when you're talking about content, uh, communities, really social media. Uh, and the third is search. Uh, and we're in all three spaces, not with equal success, but we're in all three spaces. Uh, you know, we have Windows and Azure as hugely important platforms. Uh, LinkedIn and GitHub are both really popular. Uh, you know, community-oriented spaces, as is uh, something like Xbox Live. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we have a number of places where people share uh, mm -hmm. comments and even content with each other. And, and then, of course, we've got Bing with the search engine space. Um, and, uh, yeah, <clears throat> and then if you put this in the context of time, in the 1990s, you know, the sense was, look, let's give all technology pretty much a pass. That's what Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act did. And I think it did it for good reason at that time. These technologies were young. Uh, nobody really had a model for how to impose any kind of balanced regulation on them. There was a real danger that regulation would choke them off before they had the chance to grow. Mm -hmm. Certainly in 2000, you saw the pendulum start to shift. I would say 2019 was a watershed year. It was a watershed year, I think, for two reasons. First and most importantly, in the wake of the Christchurch terrorist attack, the Australian government and then others really moved forward with much more aggressive regulation. So much so that if you don't get extremist violent content off of your, your service expeditiously under Australian law, uh, your executives risk three years of imprisonment and your company risks paying a fine equal to 10% of its revenue worldwide potentially. So that gets people's attention. Uh, and then second, I think really led by, you know, frankly, good reporting by the New York Times, there was more scrutiny of the tech sector, including Microsoft, you know, asking whether we were really doing a good enough job uh, to combat child exploitation. And the answer was no, we, we needed to do more. We continue to do more and we continue to need to do even more. You know, so yeah, I, I do think search in particular um, you know, has certain sensitivities because I think if you can't find something on the web, you're almost denied your, your place in the public square. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that you know, that counsels, I think for a less restrictive public policy for search. Um, I do think that you know, in the social media space, and we saw it after Christchurch, whether it was for Twitter or uh, or, or YouTube, the two biggest platforms, but also for, for those like LinkedIn. Um, you know, we did recognize that there were certain places where we needed to impose the ability to interrupt live streaming, um, exercise you know, some more control over the nature of live streaming. Um, and yet I think we've also wisely decided that it probably doesn't make sense to impose the same granularity of obligations on the platforms because then you have two people trying to police the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I actually think there's been some interesting progress. There's been more um, you know, sort of new ideas emerging, some new consensus. Uh, the, the Christchurch call uh, for action has more than 50 governments on board as well as really the whole big sec the tech sector, at least in the big tech companies. Uh, and, you know, it's not a Section 230 model. <laughs> it's a model that says we do have certain responsibilities uh, and we're going to uh, follow through on them. What's been interesting to me is to see maybe a company in the era of rights and public health is an emerging third era I'd call, it doesn't have the best name, process or legitimacy which says that as companies say, all right, we've got to maybe be more involved here and we've got to apply principles and those are inherently value laden. What are some of the external sources, the compasses we can turn to 
so that not every value laden decision is sort of treated as a customer service issue internal to the company. And I think of Facebook's still standing up uh, uh, external review board for its content decisions as kind of a first effort in that area of, of seeing how it still might be a decision effectuated by the company, but one very much more porous to outside decision making. In this case, literally taking some of the authority Facebook would otherwise have and having an outside group uh, uh, populated to, to make it. So I don't know if there's anything in uh, your well, plan. I think, that would... I think that's an interesting uh, insight. I think what it really suggests is we're, we're on a path towards greater regulation. Mm. Um, you know, if, if you're going to surrender your decision-making responsibility to a group of unelected officials, um, you know, does it make ultimately more sense to yeah, have elected officials or at least people who are appointed by government officials who in turn are elected uh, to reflect, uh, you know, the public will, obviously, and especially in democratic societies. Yes. Uh, you know, because these are ultimately, I would yes. say, timeless values. And something like that review board is an interesting way of trying to run down the middle and say, well, maybe it won't be a government body doing it. And of course, the kind of speech restrictions that private companies might impose on, on social media, at least in the American context, would be non-starters under the First Amendment if the government did it. But still, again, finding having it both be external to the company, but not an artifact of the government. And I don't know if that's the best or the worst of both worlds. Well, I think what you're pointing out, and I think it's a good point, is the, the, uh, you know, the United States is really unique with the First Amendment. If you, you, if you take you know, 200 nations and you know, rank them from left to right in terms of you know, which is the most protective of free expression and which is the least, uh, you know, it is one area where the United States is always the most protective of, of free expression because of the First Amendment. And there's a lot of great things that have come out of that. Mm. But I actually think in the world today, if you're a global tech company, um, yeah, if the UK and Germany and France and Australia and New Zealand and Japan and Canada um, all pursue a common path and they all regulate content more than the First Amendment would permit the United States government to do, um, yeah, I, I think, frankly, most companies are going to snap to a global standard mm. uh, and you are going to see you know, re regulation. And in fact, we are seeing regulation. It's just less likely to be driven uh, by the United States government, yeah. especially at the national level. It calls to mind the observation. I forget if it was John Perry Barlow or John Gilmore who said on the internet, the First Amendment is a local ordinance. <laughs> uh, one last uh, question before we turn to some of the questions that have entered the queue. And um, that is another comparison between all those years ago and now, and you said they're just a handful of patent lawyers. And we're also a handful of government affairs folks uh, at Microsoft. And I think uh, the American West Coast, whether North or further south, had a sense of being apart from all those games in Washington kind of thing. Um, and I think uh, maybe one of the kind of big milestones in your professional career and in the development of Microsoft as a company in the wake of the antitrust case was saying, you know, it's time to make peace. It's time to actually take seriously what's going on with governments. And that's even reflected in many of your reflections today. And uh, uh, I see, for example, and this is worthy of inclusion in your bio at the outset, you chair a nonprofit, Kids, Kids in Need of Defense, providing pro bono free legal support to unaccompanied immigrant children facing deportation in eight of the largest U.S. cities. That is both a clear, it couldn't be a more classic pro bono activity for a lawyer to undertake. Uh, it's also a political act in this environment. And uh, I juxtapose that with um, the observation you've made that uh, when acting in the political realm, getting things done means you have to deal with the world of politics and politics is about pragmatism, not just principle alone. And I'm just wondering how, how your thinking has evolved in squaring uh, both corporate political activities, donations, looking to be able to be an effective actor in the company's interests and its values, when that might mean supporting politicians that have a very different matrix 
of commitments and priorities. And further, um, you, you referenced uh, heading up Microsoft as kind of being more dean or provost of a university rather than CEO of a company, that there's a lot of views under your roof that the employees might have. So I don't know either if there's any thoughts you have on those external relationships with government and when it's time to act on what you'd view as principle and when it's time to be able to bend and not break and be a pragmatist and what it means to have corporate values knowing that you've got a university's worth of people underneath that may all have very different sensibilities. Well, I, you know, I think you've just captured so many really interesting and important elements. And I, I guess I would just offer a, a, you know, sort of three pieces to it. First, I do think it's just really important in a, in a company today, at least as we aspire to lead it, um, you know, to have good listening systems and to hear from our employees, as well as groups outside the company, including, you know, groups like the Berkman Center, which have been, you know, really important and, and influential in terms of our thinking over time. Um, it doesn't mean that you agree with everyone because you cannot agree with everyone. The diversity of views is, is so vast. But you want to listen to everyone uh, because I think when you do, you come to understand better the problems you need to solve. Um, we try to go from that understanding to then the articulation of defined principles uh, that will guide our work. Um, and those principles always mean that we will do some things and we won't do others. Um, and you know, there are always people who disagree with the decisions that we make, and they do it for all the right reasons out of great sincerity. But I do find even when they disagree with our ultimate decision, um, they do value the fact that we have sought to articulate principles, mm. and they know, you know in a more transparent way where we're going. So that's mm. the first thing. Hmm. You know, the second thing is, uh, you know, this blend of, of principle and pragmatism, I think, has been you know, a really interesting challenge, I'll, I'll say, especially during, um, you know, the last four years of American politics, um, you know, with even a, a, a more polarized uh, public and electorate. Uh, and obviously, you know, leadership in, in the White House that is, say, you know, very different from, uh, you know, I'll just say, the opinions that we tend to hold on something like immigration. Hmm. And... You know, what I've found is the best way in that particular context to blend principle and pragmatism is to get comfortable just saying what we think, not hesitating if it will lead to a disagreement, but frankly, always staying focused on the policy and the merits and not on the people or the personalities. Mm -hmm. And always to give credit where credit is due, but also be quick to identify where we want to take a different stand. And so like even over the last month, um, you know, every time we've gone to the White House in the last month and asked for help to get surgical supplies into the country to expedite uh, an importation process, you know, to, to, to solve a practical problem, um, you know, the team at the White House has been quick to respond, effective in its uh, efforts, and we've been quick to say thank you, not just privately, but to acknowledge that publicly. That might be Monday, but by Thursday, there's the latest immigration proposal, and you just sort of go, oh my gosh, you know, do we have to do this yet again? Uh, and it happened on you know, green cards over the last couple of weeks, and we were equally quick to say, we don't think this is the right course. Um, you know, even interestingly on the issue of DACA, you know, we're the one company uh, that has sued the federal government, not just as an amicus, but you know, as a plaintiff. We are a plaintiff with Princeton University and a Princeton now alum in the Supreme Court. Um, and, and yet we're able to balance those two. And I just find it, it, as people get, you know, if they know where, what you're going to do, if you're predictable and you don't make it personal, um, you can blend uh, principle and pragmatism. I will say you have this added feature in the United States. Um, we, as we all know, U.S. politics is based to some degree on people writing checks for donations, including from a political action committee like the one we have a, as a company. And the hardest thing there is almost inevitably, um, almost everyone who helps you on one issue is not someone that will help you on every issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, you know, there are some members of Congress, the House or the Senate, uh, you know, with whom we vigorously disagreed on something like 
um, you know, H-1B issues or, or DACA or the rights of women um, or, you know, marriage equality and the like. I mean, we've had vigorous uh, disagreements and sometimes continue to do so. And, and yet you find that on a particular green card reform bill, you know, where we have thousands of employees in a, in a green card backlog because they're, say, from India or China, you know, the same senator is the key senator uh, who is working to advance the legislation on which so many of your employees depend. Hmm. And, you know, so we, 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 we try to think broadly ourselves. We do focus on, you know, values and the like. Um, but it is a, a world where, you know, we do, frankly, sometimes feel that, hey, look, we've got to work with people and we've got to use that work over time to nurture a relationship that we hope just might enable us to change people's minds. Mm -hmm. When we persuaded Washington State to become one of the first states in the country to recognize marriage equality back in 2012, it was because we were able to persuade four re Republicans in the state Senate. That was the difference between victory and defeat. They had long been opposed to it. We had worked with them anyway on other issues and we had trust and we used that to persuade them to change their views and their votes. So I, I sometimes just remind myself, remind the people we work with, um, you know, the views that somebody has today does not necessarily guarantee the views they're going to have two years from now. And we're only going to have an opportunity to change their mind if we actually know them. Thank you so much. So we should uh, do some Q&A. And uh, knowing that there's a hard stop in approximately, or maybe even exactly, 10 minutes, uh, we'll think of it as a lightning round. And uh, for all but one, I'll just sort of read the question on behalf of kind of Vox Populi. But for the very first one, our mutual colleague, David Wilkins, I think is able to pop in and uh, kind of surprise cameo and ask a question himself, our colleague, uh, uh, professor of uh, uh, the legal profession. Yeah. No, I know David well. It'll, it'll be great yeah. to see or hear him. <clears throat> David, over to you. Well, thank you so much. And Brad, it's wonderful to see you. And, and thank you for your uh, amazing leadership, not just in the uh, on these issues, but in the profession in general and at our center. We're so grateful to have you as uh, on our advisory board. Um, I'm going to, my question really is about the legal profession and, and what role you see lawyers playing in these sorts of matters. And uh, at the Center on the Legal Profession, we've actually been watching a trend that we wonder whether it's going to be accelerated uh, because of the current crisis, like so many others. I mean, uh, like everybody else, we're all working virtually. Technology is so important. Again, we have to thank you because we're working on Teams and Microsoft, which has been incredibly important for our team to stay together. But the trend I want to talk about is lawyers like you taking on um, more capacious responsibilities around these big global challenges. You're kind of a, a patient number one, and Jonathan brilliantly talked about your uh, career, but you were the first one to really become not just general counsel, but then chief legal officer and then president of Microsoft. But if we look around, we see Kent Walker, for example, become, at Google, becoming Senior Vice President of Global Affairs, or Amy Weaver at Salesforce, becoming President and in charge of global security, uh, or Sarah Moss, not in the tech industry, but at Estee Lauder, becoming now the uh, Vice Chair of the company. And I wonder why you think this is happening? What role, what are the skills that lawyers bring to these broader roles? And do you think this is something we may see accelerate in the coming years? Thank you so much, David. Over yeah, to you, Brad, well, we, for the lightning round. <laughs> yeah, and I'll try to be brief. Um, well, Dave, but David, first, thanks for everything that you personally have been leading in the center. And you know, I've always been so personally passionate, and Microsoft has been for your work. Um, I do think it is a trend that has been ongoing that will continue to accelerate. Uh, you know, part of it is you know, call it the rise of the in-house legal department, something you perhaps more than anyone, better than anyone, has documented. Uh, 
um, and recessions actually tend to lead typically to more work coming in house because people are looking for new ways to uh, economize. Uh, if you look at the, the lawyers in the profession in say the 60s or 70s, you know, the really influential figures in, in the world of public affairs um, were in the great law firms. And the great law firms are still great, but you also see people playing a very broad role uh, in uh, a lot of different other organizations, especially say companies and, and nonprofits. Uh, I absolutely continue to believe that if you wanna change the world, go to law school, at least think about it. Uh, because at the end of the day in the democracies of the world, it is the laws of the world uh, that will continue to have the most impact on societies. And as laws and companies intersect, as companies use their voice through the kinds of government affairs efforts that Jonathan was describing, uh, as we do and strive to do in a very transparent way, it does give us the opportunity to think broadly. Um, just as you know, people sort of documented outside lawyers in the 60s and 70s who sort of aspired to be not just great lawyers for their clients, but also statesmen, yeah, I think you know, the people you're describing are statesmen, they're stateswomen, they're real leaders, and I think it's all about breadth of perspective. Uh, and I think if, if people can, can think broadly, think about the public interest, even put the public interest first and forward, uh, yeah, I, I think it is a, a powerful way to contribute to the public good. As I always like to say, um, you can be a public service even if you're not employed in the public sector. Uh Thank you, David, for that uh, question. And that uh, actually captures a bunch of the questions. Uh, many, I think, are from law students or others who are law adjacent asking about the role of the lawyer and the legal profession uh, in this. From a different angle, this from, uh, we invoked his name earlier, I did, uh, Bruce Schneier. Uh, he says, I taught your digital Geneva Convention and your tech accord uh, last week in my class at the Kennedy School. Now, a few years later, what's your assessment of the initiative? What's changed today? What would you do differently if you were starting over? Um, I continue to be a big believer in the need for the international rule of law to govern the actions of nation states when it comes to cybersecurity attacks. Uh, I continue to believe that we are going to need stronger rules and more formalized international laws in the future. I continue to believe that when there are gaps in the legal system today that we need to fill in. Uh, and I think the nation state attacks around disinformation, including in the COVID-19 pandemic, and especially around threats to democracy, really shine a light on that. Um, when we started down the path, I gave a speech in 2017 calling for a digital Geneva Convention uh, to sort of put off limits these kinds of nation state attacks on, on civilians. Um, one of the things I said was this was gonna be at least a decade it will be at least a decade. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, we sort of understood going into it that it would be complicated, that it would require persistence, uh, that it would be hard on certain days to get people off the sidelines to actually join the group, the, moment, the movement that I think is needed to, to protect people around the world. Um, maybe I would have advised myself to be prepared to be even more patient and persistent uh, uh, and, and pragmatic as well. It goes back to your point, Jonathan, you know, gotta be principled, you gotta be idealistic, but you gotta be pragmatic. Um, I'm glad we undertook what we did. Um, we are making some real progress. I think that's good. The Tech Accord is a good example, 120 companies around the world having signed that. Um, we're gonna have to be persistent uh, and, you just, just keep at this every year, to be honest. Mm. That's certainly a high mountain to climb, but a, a worthy a worthy challenge. Uh, I think this will probably be our last question, and then we'll be sure to bundle up all of the questions that came through. I see just under 60 of them, uh, <laughs> so that you can have a look at it uh, uh, and be aware of what people are asking about and thinking about uh, afterwards. Um, and this is, again, from our uh, quite strong student contingent. What's your advice to law students to best prepare themselves for the digital economy, including skill sets and knowledge beyond the traditional JD education? And a bonus question of, talk about a broad question, if you had to pick a topic to start a PhD today, what would it be? 
Um, I don't know if I'll have the chance to reflect enough to answer that one well, but let me just say generally, um, of course, you know, take the courses in law school that have always been important in law school. Um, if you have any interest in using digital technology or working in a digital world and the whole world is becoming digital, um, I would encourage you to you know, you take a course or two that might be outside the law school or more informally uh, you know, to acquire some background, not just in computer science, but increasingly statistics and data science. I think the future is going to be about data as much or even more than code. Um, if I were back in law school, I probably would have found a way to take one or two courses in the business field. Uh, just because it doesn't matter what you're going to do, I find that business thinking helps you organize whatever you want to do in life. And you know, I find a lot of classic business school thinking needed right now in governments around the world to, to manage you know, COVID-19. Um, I would definitely be a strong voice for the liberal arts. Uh, I constantly encourage engineers at Microsoft and elsewhere you know, to think about ethics, to, to think about history. Um, because you know, all of these issues need to come together uh, because we need to ensure that technology actually serves people and is governed ethically. Um, but I'd actually conclude with the phrase that you used, Jonathan, in describing about the Digital Geneva Convention. You said it is a high mountain to climb. My number one piece of advice, my request, climb high mountains. You have a whole career ahead of you. It's going to start in a valley, the valley of COVID-19, but that valley isn't going to last forever. We'll pull ourselves out of it. You are the people who actually will play such an important role in the decades to come in not just influencing, but defining the high mountains that we climb as a country and as a world. And they will be hard to climb. We will often falter or fail, but we will not climb any higher than you aim to accomplish. So have high ambition. That's what I say to our folks every day at Microsoft. It's what we bring together when we, we, we recruit people to join us. It's just more fun to climb high mountains than to go through every day with low ambition. And know that if you do it in a smart way, your impact will be felt and it'll be great for you personally. And, and I, I really do believe for the world. Well, what a great long-term reminder while we're, if we're not medical professionals in the short term being told that our best contribution can be simply to stay at home. And uh, what a nice counterpart to that, to be thinking well, about how we can. I, I will just say in closing, I heard someone say that this morning, uh, he said, I don't know whether I'm working from home or sleeping in the office. <laughs> well, now I'm doing both. <laughs> the lines are blurred. Thank you again, Brad, so much for uh, this conversation uh, and for uh, no doubt the other uh, interactions that will follow and uh, to all in the audience who came forward to, uh, to listen and to suggest uh, your questions. Um, and we will keep climbing the mountains. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Good to see sure you. Sure thing. Cheers. Bye, everybody.